Hello, everybody, and welcome or welcome back to The Second Shelf and to another Recent Reads on Sunday. Yeah, do you remember those? I used to do them like every Sunday or almost every Sunday, but uh, before I started to film, I checked, and the last one was mid-September. And then all kinds of other stuff happened, like Victoria and what have you. But it, it's really time to do another Recent Reads on Sunday. And what I will do, um, I also indicated that in the show notes, this is the non victober edition, because I want to keep the Victoria Reads and the other Reads separate. You know, some people might not be interested in the Victorian uh, read-along and other... Anyway, I thought it was a good idea, so we just roll with it. Um, and I'll start with the books that from the last time that I filmed the recent reads and all the other wrap-ups that I did that I didn't uh, mention, but that I did finish. And the first one is a book that I actually very recently finished, and that's Becky Chambers' novella, um, A Prayer for the Crown Shy, which is the second installment of the Monk and Robot series. Um, and this, it's a duology, so this is the last part, and it was published earlier this year. I talked about the first part, uh, Prayer for the Wild Build, um, and that I really liked this uh, series centering, uh, um, uh, it's situated in Panga. Uh, we don't know exactly what or where that is, whether that is on Earth or somewhere else. And the society had um, uh, lived on robots, so to speak. They did all the menial work, and at some point they became self-aware and they left. And the society now is more or less an utopian, uh, utopian society, so it's not a dystopian um, kind of series. And we follow two characters, one of which is sibling Dex. Um, uh, they are a monk, a tea monk, so they serve tea, uh, they travel around Panga and serve tea and listen. So it's a sort of a therapy thing. And the other character is Moscap, and he is a robot. And the encounter between robots and humans hadn't happened anymore for hundreds of years. And then all of a sudden, Moscap, Moscap comes out of the woods, <laughs> if you will, and he and Dax travel together. That's basically the premise and the setup. Um, oh, yeah. And I should also mention, we discussed this book um, uh, on Saturday, so yesterday, on uh, the channel of the Booktube Goddess, who always does a live stream every Saturday uh, where uh, she gets into uh, uh, drag makeup. And this time, it's not that we always discuss a book, but this time uh, we discuss prior of, uh, Prayer for the Crown uh, Shy. And it was really, really a lovely discussion. And it's a lovely channel anyway. So if you don't know her, uh, check her out. She mostly reads uh, sci fi. Uh, she also does. Uh, um, uh, reviews of uh, uh, games and uh, things like that. So if you are into that, uh, give the channel a go. But anyway, crown shy, what does that mean even? I'm glad you ask because I didn't know either. So I had to, I'm not, you know, science. Um, uh, I, I'm not that knowledgeable about science. Let's put it like that. But it seems to be a thing. I will put a picture up here. Um, so there are trees that are called crown shy, and that means, like you see in the picture, they don't want, quote unquote, their crowns to overlap for unknown and various possible reasons. Uh, and of course, in the book, it's a metaphor. Anyway, I really enjoyed this uh, duology. It, it tackles a lot of important and interesting questions, but it's lighthearted, delightful, hopeful, without being cheesy. So I, I definitely enjoyed uh, this one a lot. Um, the next book uh, I want to talk about that I finished that was a buddy read with Adam. As if you follow my channel, you know that Adam and I slowly but surely are making our way through Ursula Le Guin's uh, work. Um, and this month we tackled the Annals of the Western Shore, her fantasy YA uh, trilogy. And 
last week or, or today, yesterday, I finished the second part, Voices. Um, and when I say tri a trilogy, it's not a series where you have to read the first book first and then continue with the series. There are characters that will pop up in the first book and in the second book. And if you've read the first book, you will know a little background, but it's, there is no need to read all the books. So you can just pick up one if one uh, catches your fancy. In this particular book, Voices, it's again about people with powers and uh, the power of storytelling. And we encounter a society where the written word is banned. Not storytelling as such. So they have oral uh, storytelling, like societies like Western societies used to have in, in the past when there was no uh, stuff to write on. There was no uh, um, writing yet. Uh, but uh, in, in this particular society, uh, uh, the written word is forbidden. And the, the uh, people who live in that society, they conquered another part of that world where the written word was very important in terms of also looking at the future, looking what you should do. So you can imagine when a, a society, when a, um, a, a people who ban the written word conquer a people who, for whom the written word is very important, clashes. I mean, Conquering is never good, but of course clashes. And the book is about, the second part, Voices, is about that clash. And we encounter two people from the first book, uh, Gray and Oric. Oric is a storyteller. His gift is the gift of storytelling. And Gray, his wife, uh, has the gift of talking. Yeah, if I say talking to animals, that's not quite right. She can... Mm, get animals to do stuff. Let's put it like that. Um, and then the main protagonist in, in the second part is, is a young girl, because this is a YA book, uh, Mamer, um, and the uh, people she lives with, especially an older man, the Waylord, who encountered uh, torture and prosecution from these new uh, rulers, and then conflict and plot ensues. I um, I liked the book, but I certainly didn't love it. I thought the second part in particular was quite dragging on with the conflict, and um, I liked the the themes that uh, Le Guin explored. I liked the world building, this idea of the importance of stories and how you keep your society's memory alive. So all that was really, uh, really good. But um, the pacing and the plot was, yeah, not bad, but not one of those Le Guin's that I'm, you know, get all gooey eyed when I talk about it. But we will uh, finish the series for sure. So uh, next one up is Powers. That's the last one in the uh, uh, trilogy. And we will probably read that in November. Um, and the last book uh, that I want to talk about uh, it is a non-Victober finish. is also a buddy read with Heidi from My Reading Life. And whenever we think, we well, we need a kind of a break, something, you know, not light particularly because it's about murder, but something that doesn't require that much brain power. And so we read the fourth part in Elizabeth George's Linley's, Inspector Linley series, A Suitable Vengeance, published in 1991. Oh, and by the way, uh, The Voices was published in 2006. Forgot to say that, but you can find that as always in the show notes. Uh, so this one, uh, like I said, is the fourth book. Um, and if you are familiar with the Inspector Lindley series, either from the books or from the BBC um, a television adapta adaptation, the main character is Inspector Lindley. Um, his uh, uh, assist nah, assistant, no, 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 no. <laughs> the second investigator, um, Havers, uh, and they their relationship is an important part of the series. And then you have two main side characters, Simon St. James, uh, who is a pathologist and one of Lindy's best friends, and Deborah, 
uh, and Helen, uh, to the two female uh, main protagonists. In this book, however, we go back into the past. So this is a prequel to the previous three books. And we learn how the constellation of couples, I don't want to spoil, so I am, I'm, I'm remaining a bit vague, but how the constellation of couples, uh, Helen, uh, St. James, Lindley, uh, and Deborah, how that came about. So Inspector Havers only makes a very short uh, appearance in this book, and she is not yet working with uh, uh, Lindley. Uh, the murder, uh, of course, uh, at, at the center is something uh, that has to do with maybe with drugs. Uh, we don't know yet. It has something to do with Lindley's past. Um, it's a really nice pacing as always. But if you are familiar with Elizabeth George's books, she is more character focused than page turning, suspense, blood coiling things like that. Um, but still, I mean, the murder mystery was good. The red herrings were good. The clues were good. Yeah. If you like murder mysteries, uh, the, the Lindley series is certainly some, and police procedural in particular, the Lindley series is certainly something uh, that you might want to pick up. So those are the three books, non-Victober three books that I finished um, in since last, since end of September, um, then I'm still reading um, this gothic novel, Anne Radcliffe, The Mysteries of Udolpho, which was published in 1794. I'm buddy reading this with Terry. As always, I will leave a link to her Instagram down below. And this is the, uh, the tale of a young woman who, uh, after she is orphaned, comes into the power of a a villain and, you know, plot ensues from there. We are um, almost halfway through. We will have a check-in tomorrow. And like I said earlier, uh, we will read the book, this book, uh, over the course of the whole month and maybe even into November. Uh, so I will talk more about that once we finished. And then another buddy read is, I'm still reading uh, the Long Gaze Back by Sheenette Gleason, edited by Sheenette Gleason, uh, together with Kim from Middle of the Book March. And this is, like it says on the cover, an anthology of Irish female writers. So it's short stories, uh, 25 of them, and we're reading batches of five. Uh, and we are yeah, two thirds. So we will probably finish uh, this week. And one of the uh, stories is also a Victorian story. And I read that for the prompt, Victoba prompt, uh, reader Victorian short story. So that was a short, you know, venture into <laughs> Victoba. Um, as always with anthologies, I don't love all the stories. Some work better for me than others. Most of them so far work good. Some of them I thought were really, really good. And maybe two so far of the 15 that I've read, I didn't like at all. So that, that is a good, I would say that's a, a good average for an anthology. And I really like this idea that it's a chronological, uh, overview, if you will, um, female Irish writers and their short stories. And there are writers in there who also write novels. There are writers in there who also write poetry. Some only write short stories. It's more, um, about this idea, you know, from the, the beginning, so to speak, uh, to give an overview over Irish, uh, female literature by way of short stories. So those two I'm still working on. And then I started a new one, also a buddy read uh, with Heidi from My Reading Life. And we reading a nonfiction book together. And that is Kate Moore, The Radium Girls, uh, published in 2000 and I think 18, maybe 16, but the, the right number will be <laughs> down below. Um, and th this is... a. Uh, um, narrative nonfiction about women and girls. So the title is correct because a lot of these women were teenagers, 14, 15, 16, uh, uh, when it happened, 
what the book is about. And it is about a factory, two factories to be precise, in the US, where women during the uh, during and after the First World War um, worked and painted the luminous um, numbers on watches. The, the the thing that you have on watches and with the glowing numbers. And the paint that they used uh, was powder containing radium. And that radioactive material, of course, made the numbers l luminous. And uh, there were no safety precautions. Uh, radium was at that time thought to be kind of a wonder a medicine, uh, it could cure cancer and it was good for your skin and there were uh, radium teas and, and face uh, masks and what have you. And the women, uh, of course, most of them got sick after uh, a while because uh, they used pens and because the brushes were not pointed enough, they were instructed to uh, put them in their mouths and point them with their lips uh, after they have dipped them in the powder with the radium. And you can imagine, as we now know, 100 years later, this was not good for your health at all. So this is the story of what happened in the factory, but also um, two thirds, I would say, of the book is what happened after. So the, 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 um, the attempt of these women to get justice, uh, they filed complaints, there were lawsuits, and that is the a bigger, biggest portion also of the book, what happened after. And of course, the company for the longest time, uh, not only ignored them, but flatly denied that radium would have any negative consequence. And in their defense, like I said in the beginning, people believed that radium was only good. But scientists, uh, including the one who discovered radium, uh, Marie Curie in France, she knew already and she had published that uh, you get burns, for instance, if you touch the radium. Um, uh, she died of radium poisoning or the, the effects of radium poisoning uh, later in her life. Uh, so it was not completely unknown, but the company certainly ignored all scientific um, research that would say you can't use radium in this way, or you have to, at least you have to have safety precautions for the workers. So it's it's quite horrible what you read what the the diseases that women get the way uh, of radium poisoning you know that they're, they're especially in the mouth the teeth and ulcers in in the mouth and and the the bones the jaw bones that just disintegrate yeah so it's it's not it's not a fun read but it's certainly an important book and I yeah I feel it's it's really well researched and uh, in that sense I'm enjoying it. Anyway, so these were the books that I want to talk about, wanted to talk about in my finally another recent reads on Sunday. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. As always, I'm very much looking forward to your comments and I'll see you all soon in the next one.